Welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios. Hormones play a critical role in our bodies, but what exactly are hormones and why are they important for our health? On our Living Well show, we are going to decode hormones and the importance of the pituitary and adrenal glands with Dr. Lara Paraskis, an endocrinologist with Baptist Health South Florida. Welcome back to the show, doctor. It's great to have you. I'm glad to be back. Okay, we have a lot to talk about, but first, let's start off with the big picture. The endocrine system, what does it consist of? The endocrine system essentially consists of the glands um, that produce different hormones in the body and then the other organs that uh, are the recipients of those uh, those hormones. The main one in the brain is called the pituitary gland mm -hmm. and that is kind of, we call it the master controller of the body, of most of the hormones in our body. Okay. And that um, secretes hormones that control the thyroid function, that control the adrenal glands, which are sitting right on top of the kidneys, that control the pancreas. Um, and so the pituitary gland really controls a lot of the, these different hormone levels and, and, the, or, and the organs in the body. Now, mm -hmm. besides, the Pregnancy, mm -hmm. what else can affect the endocrine system? Oh, everything. You know, certain medications can affect the endocrine system, um, different uh, conditions. If you have different growths in different organs, um, that can affect uh, the system. It can cause something to overproduce a certain amount of hormone or underproduce certain hormones. And, um, you know, surgeries, different surgeries. If you have, uh, you know, surgery to the pituitary gland or the adrenal glands, there's a lot of different things that can affect, uh, affect the glands and the production of the hormones. Doctor, what about chronic disease or conditions? Can they affect the endocrine system as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, in certain, what way? Um, so so certain conditions cause um, abnormalities in the hormones, either in the organs that produce the hormones or the organs such as the thyroid or the adrenal glands that um, that are the recipients or the con of these different hormones. Mm -hmm. And so certain things cause different scar tissue or fibrosis in organs, so the organs may not respond properly to the hormones that are released. Um, and then also, you know, you have things like diabetes that are, um, you know, a condition that affects the release of uh, insulin um, in, from the pancreas. So there's a lot of different things that can affect the different organs. Yeah. So if you do have a chronic disease mm -hmm. or a condition, or maybe you're on certain medication, mm -hmm. does that mean that your endocrine system is always compromised? Not always. It really okay. depends on you know what the medications are and what the diseases are, but there's always a possibility. So it's important if there's any, you know, if you're having any symptoms that to, to have them checked out and really take a look at a good history. What are the medications? What's the past mm -hmm. medical history? So that we can really figure out what is the underlying issue and what's going on. Right. Now, what about physical or mental stress, which seems to be two big ones. <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly. So it's interesting. So physical stress and mental stress really affect, um, is the biggest thing is the cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. Cortisol, we call it the stress hormone in the body. Um, and people who are under physical stress or emotional stress, if they're sick, if they have certain diseases, your body naturally produces more cortisol. And, um, and that's a normal response, a totally normal response. We run into problems when there's an abnormality in your body's ability to make cortisol or if it's overproducing cortisol. My, my question is, hormones they're like messengers then would oh, you yeah, say absolutely okay yeah. that's a really good way to put it essentially one organ um, produces these um, uh, these hormones and they're carried through the blood to target organs or end organs and they tell them what to produce mm -hmm. and how much to produce I want to go over some of the roles yeah, sure and the first one being growth and development mm -hmm. Right. So tell me a little bit about how these roles play into the endocrine system as well. So, you know, in adolescence or, you know, from childbirth and growing into puberty and into adulthood, the hormone levels really do change. And there's a, a, a big, um, you know, we call it like almost like a fine dance of all of these hormones and they're all interconnected. And um, they're important in, um, you know, the, the increase in growth hormone for growth and development, metabolism. These um, uh, hormones like LH and FSH, testosterone, estrogen are important as well for development of um, sexual function, uh, reproduction. Uh, they can also affect the mood, as you mm -hmm. see there. And so, you know, there's a lot of different hormones that, you know, if any of, at any point, any of them are too much or too little or they're affected, it, you can have issues with growth and development. And as we know, yeah. as we grow, especially with teenagers, we have a lot of hormones. Yes. A lot of them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what are some examples of short-term effects? You know, it, it, and it really depends on which hormone you're talking about. You know, so each hormone, if there's an issue in the short term, can have a lot of different effects. So, you know, for instance, we talked a lot about thyroid um, in past episodes and thyroid is is probably the biggest hormone that people have issues with and that can cause problems with like we talked about the weight feeling hot or cold um, hair loss um, you know if there is an issue with growth hormone in adulthood um, it can cause something called acromegaly where the bones get really thick in childhood if you have issues with growth hormone too much growth hormone mm -hmm. that's when you get the very very tall people like gigantism is what we okay. call or growth hormone deficiency is the opposite where people are very short um, so it really depends on the, the 
hormone and what is the issue? Is it over or under production as to what the symptoms are? Now, how do hormones also change or affect our food cravings? Uh, you know, it's interesting. And I think the biggest thing um, is, um, you know, the, the really the estrogen and progesterone levels and these LH and FSH that it's interesting because, um, you know, especially during the menstrual period or during pregnancy, that they say is one of the reasons why people get some di different food cravings. Yes, and it's true. Yeah. And also during um, with people with diabetes, we think um, insulin is also mm -hmm. a hormone. And so, you know, if somebody has too much insulin or too little insulin, that can also affect your um, your food cravings and that's kind of your body's uh, attempt in order to try to regulate the sugar levels if there's an issue with the underlying uh, insulin levels. Uh, doctor, are there blood tests to make sure that our hormones are in balance? And then if there are, what happens after that? Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of different blood tests. So we can really check almost all of the hormones in the body. And um, the good thing is that uh, the, the tests are very reliable. So if there's any issues, if there's any concern, we can check those levels. We can check the, um, you know, the main uh, levels that are released from the pituitary gland. We can check the end organ function. And then, you know, depending on if there is an issue, then we can address that. And we can say, what I always like to figure out is okay if there is an issue why is there an issue right you know is there is it a structural lesion is it medication related is there a deficiency and how can we fix it what is the underlying problem and and you know is it reversible or is it something that uh, if it's not reversible we can treat it we uh, the good thing with with hormones is that if there's a deficiency we can usually replace it and if there's an overproduction there are different medications that we can use to help to uh, diminish the level and, and normalize the levels okay this so there are a lot like, of options like a basic question but yeah. then what your problem primary doctor be the one to refer you to an endocrinologist or <clears throat> How would you go about even seeing an endocrinologist? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, so a lot of the patients that we see in our office are referred from primary care okay. doctors. And that's why it's important to see your primary care doctor first, because if you have any symptoms, they have the training of looking at the whole body in general, you know, the, the uh, your whole uh, system. And so if you have symptoms, they'll know, okay, well, that sounds like it may be thyroid. It sounds like it may be adrenal or pituitary. And I think that you should see an endocrinologist. And so they're usually the ones that will pick up on a problem. Now, nowadays with the internet, I think a lot of patients are, you know, doing their own research mm -hmm. online, which is good, but can also but be dangerous. But you still need to see a doctor. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, and they come in saying, oh, I'm convinced I have, a, you know, an adrenal problem. You need to check my cortisol. And then we sit down and we really talk about the symptoms, what are the underlying issues, and then we decide, okay, could it be a cortisol problem? Could it be this problem? And then we go about and test. The pituitary gland is essentially a little uh, pea-sized gland. I always tell people, uh, patients, it's right behind the eye. So it sits um, right on a bone called the cella turcica, which is right above the the sinus uh, right here in the, in the nose. So it sits right behind the eyes. The sinus bone is, it sits right on top of it. So it's a, just about the size of a chickpea. Okay. Like a garbanzo bean. Now that little chickpea, what's yeah. its function? Oh my gosh. So it is probably, <laughs> you know, of course, I think that each doctor thinks their own organ is the most important one in the body. And I'm an endocrinologist. So I think that the pituitary gland is probably the most important organ in the whole body because it really is the master regulator of all of the hormones or most of the hormones in our body. And so it releases a lot of, um, a lot of hormones that essentially tell the rest of the body what to do. And so without it, we would be lost. And so I think it's the most important gland. Okay, is it? It's also referred to as the center of human sexuality. Is this yeah, true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it essentially it it releases different hormones um, uh, that control the amount of testosterone, the amount of estrogen. Uh, you know fertility, ovulation, it helps with pregnancy. And so it's definitely very important for, uh, for sex, the sexual health as well. Mm -hmm. And in terms of for, for females, what functions do the pituitary glands regulate? The, so the difference between uh, females and males for the most part is the, the hormone called prolactin. So men actually have prolactin as well. Uh, prolactin is more important than in women because it is the breastfeeding hormone. Mm -hmm. So that's released by the pituitary gland, by the posterior pituitary, which is, um, uh, there's the two parts, the anterior, which is the big ball, and the posterior, which is right behind it. So that's probably the biggest difference. Um, they still release the same hormones, these called LH and FSH. In men, it is uh, more responsible for testosterone and sperm production. In women, it's responsible for estrogen and ovulation. Now, does the gland also regulate the thyroid? I, I, I yes, yes, absolutely. So one of the hormones that the pituitary gland releases is something called TSH. And TSH essentially is called thyroid stimulating hormone. And what that does is it goes right to the thyroid and tells the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone, which is called T3 and T4. And that's the most important regulator of the thyroid levels. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Now, the pituitary gland makes or stores many different hormones. And the following hormones are made in the interior or front part of the pituitary gland. So doctor, you mentioned prolactin, mm -hmm. which is something that women have. Right. 
and men do not, the growth hormone as well. Yes. When we talk about growth spurts and all that, that's... Right, yeah, absolutely. That's from the, uh, from the pituitary gland, from the growth hormone. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and what is ACTH? Yeah, ACTH is the one, uh, the hormone that's released from the pituitary gland that goes to the adrenal glands. And that is the one that's responsible for the cortisol production, for the amount of cortisol in the body. Okay, and the last one, the TSH, which is you the just mentioned just for thyroid. The thyroid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the role of estrogen and progesterone? So estrogen and progesterone are really important for um, in women for the the menstrual cycle, and you know certain uh, the the hormones kind of rise during certain during certain parts of the cycle, and they're responsible for ovulation. They're responsible mm -hmm. for um, uh, getting your period. They're responsible for um, maintaining pregnancies. You know, depending on if there is um, you know if there's egg implantation or not. And in men, the same thing. Um, well, they, men have estrogen, but very little. Uh, but progesterone um, and um, and estrogen can play a role in male health as well in testosterone mm -hmm. levels. I do want to ask you one question, doctor, which is why would someone come see an endocrinologist? You know, the, the most common reason for people to come see endocrinologists is probably diabetes, which again is a, the issue with insulin in the pancreas. Um, also, people come mostly for thyroid, but people also come because they, there is a, a question of a pituitary dysfunction or adrenal dysfunction as well. So those are probably the most common reasons people come to see me. Okay. Any sort of hormonal abnormality will, we deal with. Now, I just want to remind our viewers that you can call in and ask the doctor a question by dialing 855-796-4475. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to share how the Health Channel has helped you, let us know by also calling our toll-free number, 855-796-4475. Now, let's take a look at some of the symptoms someone can experience from pituitary gland condition. Headaches, fatigue, high blood pressure. These are these sounds pretty common. So how do you know it's it's for a pituitary gland issue? That is a really great question, and I think sometimes uh, it's it can be very difficult uh, when you have a lot of these symptoms because they are nonspecific. A lot of people get headaches. A lot of people are tired. A lot of people aren't sleeping well. High blood pressure is an epidemic in the United States, and so it can be very difficult to tease out what is uh, caused by a pituitary problem and what is just normal, uh, you know, lifestyle or secondary to you know other other issues. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, we keep talking about the importance of primary care doctors, um, that you see the primary care doctor because they can really see there are certain red flags if something is, uh, you know, more than expected, if it's out of proportion to the lifestyle. For instance, if your blood pressure is going up really high, but you're thin, you're eating well, and you're not having too much salt, okay, there may be some sort of underlying issue that needs to be evaluated. And so that's where that primary care doctor really is um, is important in kind of analyzing your symptoms and your and your um your health and, and determining, okay, is there something else underlying right. that needs to be evaluated? And one of the symptoms on that graphic was unexplained mm -hmm. weight gain. Mm -hmm. So how does the pituitary gland regulate how we eat, when we eat, yeah, and sure. how much we eat. Yeah, the, so the pituitary gland is, it affects weight in really the two biggest issues is the thyroid and the cortisol. And those um, hormones are really related uh, to you know our metabolism, how fast or how slow it goes, how hungry you are based on the metabolism, kind of based on your metabolic needs. And those hormones are probably the biggest key factors. And so that's what I tell my patients who come to me thinking it's possible they may have a, a hormonal issue is, uh, you know, that the thyroid, we definitely have to check the thyroid and the cortisol. Those are the two biggest things mm -hmm. that can affect it. Because it also regulates what we eat or how much mm -hmm. we eat, does it regulate what, how much we drink as well in terms of thirst? That's a good question. Um, there are certain hormones that regulate the thirst. There's um, one hormone that we didn't really talk about. Um, it's called desmopressin. It's released in the back part of the pituitary gland that controls um, how how much you um, you urinate. And so if that is off, you may urinate too much or urinate too little, and mm. that may affect the thirst. Uh, there are other things such as uncontrolled diabetes or uh, you know very high sugar levels that um, can control, uh, that can cause symptoms, including increased thirst and urination. And so that's those are more the hormones, but rather like these adrenal and the you know the cortisol and the thyroid more control appetite for the most part. But thirst is also a, an important uh, thing to note too. Now, what kind of conditions affect the pituitary gland? Are there specific ones? Yeah, there are certain ones. I mean, the biggest uh, the biggest uh, issue is a growth in the pituitary gland. So, you know, something called an adenoma. You know, I don't like to say tumor because then people think they have a brain tumor, but it is um, it's a little growth in in the pituitary gland. And most of these growths are benign, okay. but they can affect the function of the gland. Even the benign. Yeah, growth. even the benign growths can affect the function of the gland if they're really big. Sometimes they press on the normal pituitary tissue and don't 
and, and decrease the function. Uh, sometimes, it, depending on where it comes from, it can actually produce too much hormones. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably the most common I issue with the pituitary gland. Other things, you know, if you've had surgery, um, head trauma, those are things that also can affect the pituitary gland itself and the function of the glands. Certain medications, again, can affect the, the glands and the function of the gland. So those are the, probably the biggest things. So would you say overall, though, that the pituitary gland disorders are mostly caused by these growths or? Mostly, yeah. Okay. I would say that for the most part, they're caused by the growths, the growths in the glands. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the most frequent type of pituitary, pituitary gland disorder that you see in your practice? So, uh, it's a great question. I guess the most frequent pituitary issue is probably a benign, a benign growth called the ad pituitary adenoma. And most of those adenomas are non-functioning. So it's just the growth in the glands that we just have to watch and mm -hmm. make sure that it's not getting too big. Most, most of these growths stay small and they don't cause any problems and you, don't, you just leave them in and you don't need any surgery. Sometimes they grow too much or sometimes they're causing problems. And that's what we have to make mm -hmm. sure we're, we're figuring out. But that's probably the most common cause of pituitary issues. And doctor, how do you check? Great question. I mean, you know, you check uh, for the growth, you do an MRI. That's the okay. best the best way to look for the pituitary gland is to do an MRI of the of the cella, which is that area where the, of, the, of the brain. Um, and then in terms of the function of the gland, there's a lot of different hormones that we can check. And the most important thing is when you're checking these hormones, some of the hormones are released in what we call like circadian rhythm, which means that it's highest in the morning usually and lowest at nighttime. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you're looking for, you may want to do blood work in the morning and you may want to do blood work at nighttime. So the timing of the blood work is also important. I know you mentioned that sometimes if it's if it's not affecting mm -hmm. the individual and it's not harmful, they can be left untreated. Yeah, absolutely. But what if in the case that maybe we need to do surgery a person ignores it, doesn't get it treated, what can happen? You know, it really depends on what uh, what the issue is. If it's a benign growth and it's not producing hormones or not affecting hormones, it could get very big. Now, the important thing is that the where the pituitary gland is, it's a very small space. And so if it grows too much, it can press on things. And the most important thing it can press on is the optic nerve. It kind of lays right above where the okay. where the pituitary gland is. It can upset your vision? Yeah, then? absolutely. So it can, uh, it can press on the optic nerve. And Patients that have optic nerve issues from the pituitary gland, it causes peripheral vision issues. So you kind of lose the ability to see in the peripheral vision. Uh, you know, sometimes it can expand, um, you know, into the blood vessels right next to the pituitary gland, but most commonly it's the optic nerve. And then, so you know, does that mean, I'm sorry to yeah, interrupt, ahead, that you fine. often work with maybe an eye specialist as yeah, well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Anytime we have an, a, a big pituitary gland, usually more than one centimeter or something that's coming very close to that optic nerve, I do recommend to go to see the ophthalmologist and get a full visual field um, exam. Because if there is issues, if there is compromised vision, that's an indication to proceed with surgery. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, are there any other doctors that they may need to see, or you know, it, de it de depends. You know, um, sometimes we'll ha we'll send patients to see neurosurgery. Uh, neurosurgeons are the ones that would do the surgery to remove the pituitary gland okay. if necessary. If you have a question for the doctor, you know what to do. That number is eight five five seven nine six four four seven five. We'd love to hear from you. Now, Dr. Prasas, can you tell us what the adrenal glands do? Sure, the adrenal glands are these little kind of triangular shaped glands that sit right on top of the kidneys. Okay. And they are uh, very important for producing a bunch, a uh, few different hormones. There's different layers of the adrenal glands. Uh, one of the layers produces cortisol, which is probably the most important hormone or one of the most important mm -hmm. hormones that the adrenal gland produces. Uh, cortisol is important uh, to maintain your body's function, maintains your blood pressure, your uh, your weight, uh, it's, uh, you know, we call it the stress hormone. So if you're sick, the cortisol levels go up. If you're in a car accident, something happens, you need to have a high cortisol level to kind of overcome those issues. Um, it also produces something called aldosterone, which is another uh, hormone that controls blood pressure. It's one of the blood pressure uh, hormones. Uh, there is also uh, sex hormones that are produced in the adrenal glands. And lastly, it produces uh, something called like, epinephrine, which is that f produces that fight or flight reflex. And to reaffirm, you also said it helps with blood sugars, correct? Uh, well, the cortisol, the cortisol actually is, um, cortisol can affect blood sugar, absolutely, but the blood sugar for the most part is controlled by the insulin uh, producing the pancreas, which is another organ kind of, kind of more up here in the body. There was something interesting in the video that we saw before, and it mm -hmm. talked about the flight or fight. Mm -hmm. so can you explain that a little more? Yeah, so the fight or flight reflex is uh, essentially a, a sympathetic nervous system reaction that happens when you're, um, you know, it's what they say, like if you're in a car accident, you can lift up the car, uh, you know, that's that's that fight or flight reflex, and that's like an adrenaline rush. Right. And um, that's those are the hormones that are produced in one of the layers of the adrenal glands. And, um, you know, it's there so that if you are in a stressful situation, you can run away from, uh, from, from the bear, you can run away from whatever is, 
um, is harming you or you know um, and then uh, the issue in that is that if there is a problem with it usually an overproduction that can cause more issues and then you can get that fight or flight type reflex mm -hmm. all the time you know causing uh, your heart to race you can feel really hot really sweaty really anxious um, the blood pressure can go up so those are all abnormal issues that can happen uh, if that fight or flight reflex is off so when you hear someone say, oh, I had, I had the adrenaline rush. Exactly. That's what they're referring yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they're referring to. So from the adrenal glands. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now remember, you can call in and ask the doctor a question by dialing 855-796-4475. We'd love to hear from you. Now, other ways the adrenal glands help our body, and we're going to start off by talking about the cardiovascular function, mm -hmm. which is very important. So can you talk a little bit about that and how it helps? Sure. So the uh, depending on the different hormone from the adrenal gland, it really helps to establish uh, blood pressure. It maintains your blood pressure as long you know your hormones stay uh, in a good range. Your blood pressure, your heart rate stays normal. Um, you know, uh, and so that's something where again, if the levels are off, that's when we start seeing problems. You know, it's funny. I think with the endocrine system, if everything is going really well, you don't notice anything. It's keeping your body functioning really well. But when something is off, when you have too much or too little of something, that's when we start having problems. And it helps respond to stress as you yes. mentioned this is With something that we need correct mm -hmm. yeah absolutely everybody needs stress uh, well not everybody needs stress <laughs> everybody we needs like it. a little more exactly less stress -free. <laughs> I would like a break but uh, you know if you are stressed uh, you need the cortisol level and that's an appropriate response and and uh, you know it helps to maintain and it helps your body uh, in, uh, the cortisol essentially helps your body deal with that stress. Yeah. I want to call. I want to actually bring up that graphic again because this one mm -hmm. was interesting to me. It utilizes carbs and fats. Mm -hmm. In what way? You know, again, that's really uh, the the cortisol, yeah, um, and it really just helps you again with the metabolism. And, it, and that's where people say, like, if you have too much stress, you get that you get that um, the the fat around the abdomen, around the belly, because that cortisol, when it is abnormal, you get funny fat distribution. You get the distribution more around the central the central area, around the, the organs, and you actually lose a lot of the fat in the arms um, and the legs. You get like some atrophy in the muscles and the fat in the arms and legs, and it puts it right in the, in the belly. But it also distributes stored fat? Yeah, Can you explain to, that? Yeah, it helps to distribute essentially where you're storing okay. the fat. Yeah. Okay. And then obviously this is something as, as we grow, it gives body mm -hmm. odor and pubic hair, correct? Is yeah, absolutely. And that's the, the, the sex hormones that are mm -hmm. produced in the, in the adrenal glands. It's one of the, one of the things that contributes to, um, to puberty and, and our sexual, uh, you know, secondary sex characteristics, which is essentially like the, I think you were saying the body odor and the, the hairs. Mm -hmm. And doctor, how would you know if your adrenal glands are functioning properly? Yeah, again, you know, it's, it, it's a really tricky question because some of these things are very subtle. Mm -hmm. And so you may not know, you may not have an issue, um, you, an obvious issue. And that's, I think, part of the, again, part of the, the subtleties that happen with endocrinology is that you don't really notice if there is a problem unless it's really obvious. And then it's, and then it's obvious to everybody right. who's looking. But, you know, a lot of these subtle issues, it's not very, it's not very easy. And so I think it's really about explaining what your symptoms are and what the under underlying risk factors are, and then again, you know, going to somebody who can really tease out if there is a problem or not, and then doing the appropriate testing. And because of that, yeah. is it, does it take a little longer to diagnose? It absolutely can. You know, I think certain certain conditions in the adrenal glands and the pituitary gland as well are very insidious. They're very slow onset. And so sometimes it's between, you know, onset of symptoms and diagnosis, sometimes even up to 10 years before people. Wow. Yeah, before people can get diagnosed with certain conditions because the symptoms are very subtle. And until it becomes really obvious, it can be hard to um, hard to make the diagnosis and think about it as a as a as an right. issue. Yeah. Now, what are some of the symptoms of adrenal gland problems that we discussed? So if you were to have them, are they similar to the ones we discussed in the pituitary gland? Very similar, absolutely okay. very similar. And again, it depends on if the problem is an overproduction or an underproduction. Okay. You know, typically if your adrenal glands aren't working well, um, you know, you have low, low cortisol. That's probably the one that causes the most, the most symptoms. And that's what can cause you to be very fatigued. It can cause a decreased appetite, weight loss. Um, you know, it can cause a period irregularities in women, um, a lot of nausea, uh, you know, stomach up said those are the main symptoms of a low cortisol um, you know and if it's too high it's kind of the opposite people are very hungry they're eating all the time they gain weight their blood pressure goes up their face can get kind of red and ruddy um, the hair can fall out uh, but again you know these are also symptoms of other things similar symptoms to the thyroid similar symptoms to just having a poor um, poor eating habits and poor lifestyle so it can be very difficult to to tell the difference and what what the issue is so how would you measure if we have the inadequate amount of cortisol yeah. what what is 
done? This is a great question. And I think the important thing about the cortisol, and it's probably one of the most important hormones to get the timing right. The cortisol is that it's produced most in the morning and least at night time. Right. And so if you're looking for a deficiency, you want to check when it's supposed to be high. So the most important thing is to check a morning cortisol, you know, usually between eight and nine o'clock in the morning. We'll check a, a blood test, it's a blood test, okay? Mm -hmm. And if that level is low, that confirms the diagnosis. If it's normal, great, it rules it out. It's funny because there are a lot of these gray areas that we see. Um, so there, you know, if it's, if it's kind of in that gray zone, um, you can do certain tests to kind of stimulate the adrenal glands. We give an extra, uh, a hormone or medication that would essentially stimulate the cortisol production in the adrenal glands. And if there's an appropriate response, it's normal. But if there's an inappropriate response, then that tells you that there's an underlying problem. Do you check urine as well? At uh, certain times, yeah, okay. you do check urine. So it, again, it, it's hard, and I, I don't check urine all the time with cortis with um, adrenal glands, because again, it, and it has to do again with that the diurnal function. So if you check a random urine, it, it's really not going to tell you a lot of a lot of information. What you have to do, and this is where patients hate to do it, so it's I don't always order it first line, is do a 24-hour urine collection, and then essentially what they do is they look at the total amount of hormones in that 24-hour urine, right. and that essentially eliminates that uh, the the time of day issue. So, so how do you yeah. treat overall for our viewers who are tuning in at no and we're talking about adrenal glands, how do you treat adrenal insufficiency? Yeah, so adrenal insufficiency it just essentially means that the adrenal glands aren't producing enough hormone. And the, again, the biggest thing and the most important one is cortisol. And so that's um, something that we can replace. And the good thing is there are a lot of medications uh, that we can use to replace the adrenal hormones if they're deficient. Um, so cortisol, essentially, we replace that with prednisone, which mm -hmm. is essentially a steroid, you know, prednisone or hydrocortisone. There's also dexamethasone. Zone, those are the different ways that we can uh, that we can treat it, and we tend to replace the hormone that we're deficient in. What about adrenal fatigue? Yeah. What is that? Okay, so adrenal fatigue is a controversial issue. Okay. And um, I think that um, the problem with adrenal fatigue is that it's it's more of a myth. You know, in the, in the real like in the medical community, it's not a, it's not a, a true diagnosis. The the issue is that um, people with that that complain of adrenal fatigue are essentially people who feel very tired. Um, you know, they have uh, kind of non-specific symptoms of uh, sometimes the weight goes up or down. They feel hot or cold, but the main complaint is fatigue. So who's giving them that term, adrenal fatigue? <laughs> that's you, a great question. Not me. WebMD? Not, me. WebMD. <laughs> not even WebMD. But, you know, it's, again, that's, uh, the, that's the, the issue, I think, with um, the internet is that there's a lot of great information out there if you're going to the right sources. And there's also a lot of uh, very poor information out there that they can tell you, you know, essentially, I always say it depends on how you put your Google search, the answer you're going to get. And so, to, you know, if you're really looking for something, you'll be able to find it on the internet. And so it's really important when you're looking, um, when when you're looking for information that you're just looking also at the source where you're getting it from. But adrenal fatigue, I think it's an important thing to mention though because I think that you don't want to settle on, oh yes, you have adrenal fatigue, because you could have a lot of symptoms that can be indicative of other things, you know? Right. And so like a real, a, a real medical diagnosis that needs addressing and needs treatment. And so you don't want to just settle on, I have adrenal fatigue, let me take this supplement, right. when it could be very bad anemia, it could be a thyroid problem. You very well may have adrenal problems, and that's something that we can test But it may for. not be specifically fatigue. Exactly, you know? And so it's important to note that if you do have these symptoms, you don't want to settle on a diagnosis. You want to make sure you're ruling out everything and just make sure there's nothing serious. Now, can you live without adrenal glands or do you need at least one? That's a good question. Um, so we do have two, which is nice because if you need to have surgery, if there's an issue, if there's a damage in one of the glands, you can remove mm -hmm. one of them and live perfectly fine without okay. any hormones, any additional medications. Certain conditions or certain things, you um, you either have damage to both of the adrenal glands or in certain conditions, you actually have to take both of them out, not very commonly. But the good thing is that all of the hormones that we produce in the adrenal glands, we have synthetic versions of them. So if you do have to remove them or if they're both damaged, we can replace them with the medications that we have. Sometimes it takes tweaking and it's not very easy, right. but we can do it. Which is so great that's news. the nice thing. If you have a question for the doctor, you still have time to call in. That number is 855-796-4475. We'd love to hear from you. Now, more than one out of four Americans has high blood pressure. For millions of them, a little known condition is to blame. But the good news, the right treatment may cure the problem. So doctor, what causes Addison's disease? So Addison's disease is essentially an autoimmune condition where your body makes antibodies that attack the adrenal glands. And these uh, antibodies essentially attack and um, damage the adrenal glands and cause it not to function properly and cause what we call adrenal insufficiency. 
Okay. Now, what are some of the, who's at risk? I want to know first, that's who's a, at risk? That's a really great question. So people that are at risk are people that have other autoimmune conditions. Okay. So we talk a lot about the thyroid. Most of the thyroid is caused by something called Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition. Um, other uh, common autoimmune conditions are lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, certain uh, gastrointestinal diseases like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Those are people that have autoimmune conditions. And when you have one autoimmune condition, there is a higher likelihood, not a guarantee, but a higher likelihood likelihood that you may develop other autoimmune conditions in the future, and Addison's disease is one of them. I'm curious to know, is it also affected by gender? Do female get yes. more affected than males? Yeah, absolutely. So in general, autoimmune conditions are more common in females, okay. and so that's one of the reasons why we see Addison's disease more often in women. So what are the symptoms of Addison's disease? Yeah, so symptoms of Addison's essentially come from the symptoms of low cortisol or, um, you know, or the adrenal insufficiency. And the biggest complaint is fatigue. People complain of just being very exhausted, very tired, and um, they may lose a lot of weight. Their appetite is very low. They just, um, they, get they get full very easily. Um, Addison's disease, it, very interestingly, um, and it's uh, related to the, the hormonal changes, but they can get a very difficult, I mean, a different uh, color of their skin, like kind of a very bronzy color of their skin, almost like somebody's in a, a tanning salon too long. Mm -hmm. Their color gets the, kind of like a dark orangey, and that's one of the, all the hallmark symptoms. So if you have what somebody, causes that color change yeah, of the skin? It, so it's interesting. So the, um, the hormones in the adrenal gland that are affected, the biggest thing is the cortisol. And so the cortisol being low feeds back to that pituitary gland, which is kind of that master controller of cortisol level, and says, hey, I need more cortisol. And the pituitary gland responds by trying to trying to um, produce more cortisol by producing a, a hormone called ACTH, right? And that ACTH, um, it gets really high in patients with Addison's disease. And that ACTH uh, affects the, um, the melanocytes, which are essentially the, the skin uh, cells that produce color. And so you have really high levels of that ACTH and it changes the color of the skin. So Dr. Preskis, yeah. how do you diagnose Addison's and then how do you treat it? Okay, great question. So diagnosing Addison's is really about doing the blood work um, okay. and checking your cortisol levels. And it's most important, like we were talking about before, is to check the cortisol level first thing in the morning because that's really when you're going to see an issue. That's when you're going to see the, the biggest difference. Um, you know, once we do that, once we have those levels, we'll check... Um, we'll check an ACTH level. We can also check those antibody levels. Now, we don't check the antibody levels on everybody for the adrenal antibodies uh, because it's not a very common blood test. It's more expensive, and so to do it on everybody would be um, inefficient. So if you do have low cortisol, then we'll check those levels. Um, and the good thing is about treatment that we have medication to treat it. So if you're not making enough cortisol, you're not making enough of um, something called the aldosterone, we can give that back to you. We can give those in, in hormone level, in, um, in pill form. So here's an interesting fact. John F. Kennedy actually had Addison's yes, disease. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And that's why everybody always thinks he was out in the sun too long. But it was actually the, the Addison's disease that was causing the um, the the tan looking skin. Right. Yeah, he had a condition called uh, uh, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, which is kind of a combination of, um, of Addison's disease and other, um, other uh, autoimmune conditions and other endocrine things. I think I believe he also had hypothyroidism as well. So would you call that a chronic condition? Oh, absolutely. It's a chronic condition because it's something, unfortunately, that can't be cured, but it is something that can be managed with medications. Okay. So your medication basically for life. Yeah, unfortunately. For it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Now, do you need to be on a special diet if you have um, Addison's? Or no? It's a great question. Not really. Not really. Okay. No, the diet should be fine. Um, you know, the diet really won't affect the, the function of the cortisol at all mm -hmm. or the function of the medications. Um, it, it should be fine. Are there other related diseases to Addison? Uh, you know, the biggest thing is the, um, the other autoimmune conditions. That's okay. the thing that you want to make sure that you're ruling out when you do have um, Addison's. You want to check for these other things as well. Yep. Can, but you can live a normal life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, There's absolutely. no restrictions. No, not at all. I mean, the biggest thing when you have Addison's disease and you're taking medications is that in certain instances, in certain, certain circumstances, you know, we, like we talk about when you're stressed, when you're sick, if you're very, um, you know, stressed at, at work, if you're in a car accident, you're having surgery, that you actually need to take more medication. You need to take more of the pills. Um, and so it's important for those patients to know that. And like in our office, we have these things called the sick day rules or or if you're traveling to a third world country that may not have access to medications, you need to make sure you're taking extra medication with you just to make sure if you do get in what we call an adrenal crisis that you can manage it Absolutely. until you seek help. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about another condition, yeah. which is Cushing syndrome. Yes. So what exactly is Cushing syndrome? Good question. So Cushing's is an overproduction of cortisol from the adrenal glands. Okay. That's the, um, the, the too much production. Too much production, exactly, okay. of cortisol. 
And, and how common is this syndrome? You know, it's very interesting. So Cushing's, it typically, we thought that it really wasn't very common, um, that it was something that we kind of, you know, we call them the zebras in medicine, right? Mm-hmm. The things that are, are not that common. But the recent studies have shown that the cases that we call subclinical or kind of mild Cushing syndrome are becoming more prevalent in about like 3 to 10% even of patients with uncontrolled diabetes, high blood pressure, PCOS, that they may actually have um, undiagnosed Cushing's disease disease or Cushing syndrome. I have another question. Yep. Can you have both Cushing's and Addison okay. or no? Um, th- no, you can't have both. But if you have Cushing's and you have to have surgery and you remove um, an adrenal gland, there is a possibility you may become adrenally insufficient and okay. have the same symptoms and same issue as the um, Addison's disease. Now, the difference, I guess, would be the reason, the underlying cause of it, the etiology. Okay. Now, how do we maintain a healthy endocrine system? If you have to give our viewers at home any tips, what would that be? Well, I think the most important thing really is just trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle, healthy um, eating um, and diet. You know, I think that certain, um, there are, it's interesting because there are certain hormones that we, or chemicals called endocrine disrupting chemicals that are found in plastics, that are found on um, uh, microwave popcorn bags and credit card receipts that can affect the, the endocrine system. So, you know, in general, I think it's just a better idea to eat healthy, try to stay, um, you know, stay away from artificial products, you know, try to eat, um, you know, not raw food, but just kind of less processed foods right. and exercise. I think those are probably the most important things uh, that you can do for yourself to help to protect your uh, endocrine system. Do children often get a hormonal imbalance? Okay, it's a great question. And children do get hormonal issues. It's different than the ones that we're talking about today. Thank goodness there are, you know, most children don't get Addison's, don't get Cushing's. Uh, most uh, commonly, uh, the uh, there are like sex hormone uh, developmental uh, issues that that kids can get, and also sometimes growth hormone issues, growth hormone deficiencies. Those are probably the most common ones in okay. children. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying, yeah. and thank you so much for no being problem. here. It's Always pleasure. a pleasure. Be sure to join us next time on the Health Channel. All health, all the time on South Florida PBS. Follow us on social media at All Health TV, where you can get your health tips from our experts and see what's coming up on the Health Channel. And be sure to visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of the Health Channel and watch videos from previous episodes. I'm Kathy Buccio. We'll see you next time.